Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Michael Johnston. Hi there. How are you today? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. So can you tell me about what you've written? Sure. Um, It's a duology, so two book series um, called The Amber Throne, uh, Solari and Silence of the Solari. And... um, this was really this is this Solari was my debut novel, um, and it was my sort of attempt to create one of these giant um, epics that I grew up reading and loved. Um, so it was my first real big stab at a massive epic fantasy world, um, and uh, it's probably a little different than a lot of epic fantasy that has that sort of medieval kind of English forest feel. Although recently, I think we've seen a lot of really interesting epic fantasy that is different. Um, Mine takes place in something that's closer to, say, um, antiquity, sort of ancient Rome, ancient Egypt. Um, So it has a little bit more of a primitive kind of ritualistic feel. There's there's a little bit more history there and a slightly different setting that I think makes it um, a little bit unique among epic fantasies. Can you actually elaborate on that a little bit and tell me a, a little bit more about what it was like, what your world building process was like, and what interested you about that type of world? Sure. Um, you know, some of it started with I was interested in writing a, a desert epic fantasy. And, and, you know, I wanted some degree of realism in the world, in the work. I wanted to, to really, you know, feel like it could be a living, breathing world. Um, and so I, I settled on ancient Egypt as as a starting point, basically kind of for research as well as world building, um, primarily because it's the most well-known, the longest existing sort of, you know, civilization out there in the desert. So there's just so much written about it, so much information about the people and what they ate and how they live. There was, there's just so much I could research and so many details I could draw from. Uh, you know, my book is, is second world fantasy. It's not in ancient Egypt, obviously at all, or in antiquity or ancient Rome, but it, it sort of draws from these things to kind of create a realistic world. Um, so I started with Egypt and it sort of built out from there to the, you know, the ancient world, um, was very global, like our own in a way, except that that world was really the Mediterranean. So you see all these civilizations in Africa and in Greece and in Rome, um, trading and communicating. And so I kind of built my own little, little, uh, they call it the Levant, which is the name for that kind of part of the world in, in antiquity. And so I built my own sort of little world of kingdoms that sort of resemble that. Cool. Yeah. Um, what was it like building those kingdoms and trying to make sure that they're still fantasy, but having that touch of realism in it? Yeah. I, I don't think that's, um, you know, the realism is kind of what you, the research is what you go to when you need like little details to like, you know, what would you eat and what would the plants be and how would that influence the characters and their lives? Um, and I used it, you know, the, the realism is, is, is used just as an inspiration sometimes. And sometimes there's some real details, like the kind of, like if you were living in a desert, you have a civilization, what kind of cloth would you have access to? And what would you be able to make, you know, a rope out of, you know, back then? And so those were all things I could go to and build out. And they gave you details because you know what the rope felt like and, you know, what they made. So there's some very real details that I kind of called from that history. And there's some just sort of general ones, you know, like, like how would a desert civilization work? Where does the water come from? You know, and like, you know, in, in the, in, in Egypt, they had the Nile and what made Egypt work was that every year the Nile would flood and that flood water would enrich the soil so they could farm it. And Egypt was the breadbasket of antiquity. They made, they actually had a surplus of grain and they would ship it all over the world. Um, it, it was so bountiful that land. So, and I use that in a way, but my, there's no Nile river in mind. There's actually just this sort of magical crop that makes the, um, the desert, um, the land arable, so you can grow things in it. Um, so that, I guess that's a long way coming around to the, uh, uh, point. Um, the, uh, that's sort of a way I'd sort of mixed history and magic. I took something that was very, um, 
you know, just very practical, this notion that, okay, the river had to overflow so you could actually have some sand that you could grow some stuff in it. And I sort of turned it into something a little magical. Cool. Yeah. Were you interested in that part of the world and like that time before you started writing? it? Yeah. You know, um, I have a background in architecture. I have a master's in architecture and uh, I studied a lot of art and architectural history. And, and when you study that history, it always sort of starts, you know, sort of cave paintings, but most of it kind of starts in antiquity, um, the history of art and architecture. So whenever you take these classes, whether it's art history or architectural history, you always start at that point. So it's kind of, it's this thing that sort of sticks in the mind of everybody who has that sort of background. And I, I took a lot of history in college and grad school. Um, so it was something that I was always really fascinated about with and something that I've always read about. So when I started writing, it was sort of a natural go-to for me. Well, yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but your book is inspired from King Lear, correct? A little bit, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's um, for me, it's almost uh, sort of a, a touching off point. It was I was interested in that plot archetype uh, in King Lear, where you have this sort of king who's also a father and he has these three kids and there's this scene that we all know from Lear um, that we've seen it in, in movies like Kurosawa's version ran um, where the king, you know, divides up his kingdom among the three children and uh, asks them each to sort of express their affection for him. And he's going to dole out his community based on, you know, how much flattery he gets from them. So um, and I love that that moment. Um, and I, I actually started my book when I was thinking about it almost 10 years ago, uh, with that moment, cause it's such an iconic moment. And it, it was in many early drafts of the book. It's actually not in the final draft of the book that was published. Um, and I like that because I eventually what I came to realize is I didn't want someone to ever feel like they were reading a King Lear kind of book. Like it, it really is epic fantasy. And I want you to be in an epic fantasy world. I don't want you to think, oh, that's this King Lear character. Because to me, that kind of breaks down the the book a little bit too much. You know, you, you're not in epic fantasy anymore. You're in Shakespearean fan fiction or something, you know. Oh, yeah. um, so so there aren't any actual scenes in it, but the sort of DNA, that that plot archetype of this father who's king, who, who divides up his kingdom and the sort of the descent into madness that Lear goes through after that, are all sort of echoed in my book. So there, there's, a, there's a little King Lear hidden in there. And it was a great starting off point, but I definitely didn't, I didn't want people to feel like they were ever reading King Lear. I thought that would ruin, wouldn't really feel like an epic fantasy then. I think that's really fascinating. And I also write, in a, and in my work, I try to also like pepper in some things like where it's like, it's an, it's alluding to this story, but it's not blatantly this. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, you know, otherwise I feel like it would kind of take you out of the moment and the characters and the, I mean, it's the whole reason we write epic fantasy, right? In a mm-hmm. second world setting is to to have it a world that feels real on its own. Um, and, you know, it's not alluding to anything else. Yeah. Um, so how did you get into writing? That's an interesting question. I mean, it's, I guess everybody does it. Who's just a, who's a big reader, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I um, I'm just somebody who I think like like a lot of other authors, you know, fell in love with books when they were you know a kid and just never stopped, never stopped reading and writing. Um, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm trained as an architect and I worked as an architect for many years, but I also worked on writing in books at the same time. So it was like this, it was like kind of this slow burn thing that I was doing in the background. Um, my wife is a young well I guess she's middle middle grade and young adult and uh we wrote a trilogy together back in like 10 years ago um so that was that was really my first official kind of foot in the world um but it was a very different book from what I did when I started writing on my own but it was interesting that was actually how I got started in writing oh that's really cool what was it about it was it was a really fun idea um it was a sort of mashup of, I think it was a little ahead of its time even. It was uh, it was called Heart of Dread series. Uh, the first one was called Frozen. Um, uh, we titled it before the Disney movie, by the way. <laughs> I was like, no, that Disney movie. But uh, 
it was, it was actually, it was, so it was a little bit, of, it was a sort of post-apocalyptic world. I, I sort of always called it like Lord of the Rings in reverse. You know, in Lord of the Rings, the sort of magic is leaving the world and we're sort of entering this modern humanistic world of men. This was sort of the opposite where you're in a post-apocalyptic world where the world of mankind and reason has sort of died out. We've destroyed ourselves. And in this world, magic is coming back into the world. Like it's Oh, that sounds out. awesome. It's, it's like, Having a fantasy world again so that that was the premise that sounds awesome so was it like more of a like did it take place in like the future and that's coming yeah, in no, or was it, it, it it's in the it's in the near future like you know i can't remember the date of it actually but it's it's you know it's like you know 25 years in the future 30 years in the future sort of po- the the feel of it you know sort of a near future a little bit more technology and so forth but near future post-apocalyptic setting that sounds so awesome. That's right up my alley. Um, so when you're writing, like more a little bit more on the like the technical side, how do you get into the proper headspace for writing? And do you have any tips for writers that struggle with that? You know, it's interesting. And maybe it's because, you know, I used I had an architecture firm and I was working as an architect and I was, especially like on that trilogy we just discussed, I was writing at the same time. So I'd have to Sometimes it was a day on, sometimes it was a day off, or sometimes I would just work at my office. And when I got tired of working on architecture, I would, you know, squeeze in some time for for fiction. Um, and so I've always treated it very much um, like a job. Um, I try not to be too precious about it. Like I do try to, as hard as it is, force myself to just be at my desk by. It's not that early, but I try to. Sometimes I have to drop off kids, you know, life, all that. I mean, I try to just be at my desk by 10 and, you know, stay there except for lunch until six. I just try to really be, I try to just treat it like a job. I think that's the only way I can do it. Otherwise I get so precious about it and I get so worried, you know, I only want to create when I'm in the mood or something, but it just doesn't work. Like it, I, I treat it like a job. Like it, it, it seems like dumb advice, but I think that is the best advice to just, mm-hmm. you know, sort of force yourself even you know even if you're you're doing it part-time you can't be there from 10 to 6 maybe your time is after work from 8 to midnight or something but something that makes it feel professional like this is what I do you know yeah that that's what I I did to a degree during NaNoWriMo which I did last year and it was like these times I'm doing I'm writing this much and yeah yep 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 I'm just I'm gonna be professional I'm gonna get a thousand words done a day something like that just those those goals, I think really, um, you know, even especially when I'm on a draft, I'll just say it's, you know, I'm editing 50 pages a day. Like I always, I, I try to be professional as I can. I try to create goals. I put it all in my calendar, like page 150 today, 200 tomorrow, you know, um, all that really helps. Cause I mean, obviously, as you know, as writers, it's so easy to procrastinate, um, mm-hmm. you know, and to just, you know, flick on the internet and then there yep. goes their, their afternoon if you didn't have a goal. So I try to do that. Yeah, definitely. So has your career as an architect influenced your writing? You know, it has. And that's that's really, um, it's an ongoing project because I, I'm interested in the two having some kind of relationship. I don't know if they actually have one in real life. Building buildings is really different than writing books. Um, there's probably no direct correlation, but I've imagined lots of them. And, and some of them is is the historical element. Like architects are obsessed with history. Um, you know, we love to read about the history of our own profession, uh, the history of art. So, um, yeah, you get you, there's there's a lot of like loving descriptions of sort of buildings and stuff. But I, I, I make sure not to get too carried away with it. You know, I, mm-hmm. I'm writing fiction. I'm not creating architectures. And I, I think they're very different. So um, I'm always searching for ways to make them more similar and to let them influence me. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a big planner. I do a lot of outlining and there's there's a kind of architectural nature to outlining it is in a sense you're creating structures and uh they work great with plot um kind of creating that you know my books have these kind of big epic plots that slowly evolve over the entire book and everything kind of ties together at the end so um you know i sort of plot with an architect's mind in a way um and i think that that's definitely had an influence on me and i think definitely writing epic fantasy um, for me at least, and I know some authors don't do this at all, um, but it, it, it helps for me to, 
to spend all that time working on the structure of the novel in advance. And you know, I still improvise. It's not I'm never, the the outline is not something that I'm ever enslaved by, um, you know, or anyone should be. It's it's purely you know a, a starting point each day when I work. Mm-hmm. So when you outline, how do you personally do it? Because everyone, I know everyone has totally different styles. Um, I'm very incremental. Like I'll start with an idea or a few ideas and I'll start to look at some kind of plot structure that they might fit into. And, you know, maybe that becomes a paragraph. And that paragraph becomes a page after that. Um, and so I, I'll sort of take like the seed and grow it, which sounds very organic for somebody who likes plotting, but that's how it always starts. Um, I'll, I'll just let it build and build, you know, just something that's usually like a five or 10 page outline. And I'll take it up to 20 pages, you know, something that feels like it's small, but can encapsulate the whole book. Um, I find that if I don't do that, I get really lost if I don't have everything sort of roughly figured out. Um, and then I will, when it's time to write it, I, for both of the novels in the series, I did break it down into chapters prior in prior to writing them. And I felt like that really, helped me. It let me really develop the world and the pacing um, and work out a lot of the twists. Um, and, you know, I made changes, you know, the mm-hmm. chapters were always moved around. There's a lot of work afterward, but um, I'm pretty methodical about it. Yeah. Do you think that ever for books in the future, you would do, as they say, and a lot of the stuff here, you would be a pantser and yeah. not plot out everything? You know, I've, I, I, I always think of that I'm actually a hybrid. I, I would never, I, I've tried going in and just freely writing and it just, um, it, it, if I don't know where I'm going, it just gets lost. The whole, the chapters don't build one after another. So I don't, I've read about people who do that. I, I, I've read Stephen King and how he talks about how he does that, how, and, and I, I see how he, he does it. I understand conceptually, but I can't do it myself. <laughs> I've tried really hard. I'd love to, but I, you know, I do, um, I do improvise on my outlines. So in a sense, I was like, well, I'm kind of a pantser. Like if I see, you know, like I have my best ideas while I'm writing and sometimes I'll get a completely new idea. There's nothing to do with the outline and I'll just run with it. But, you know, I always end up kind of tying it all back into the outline. I need that structure, that framework to, to fall back on. Um, and I, so I think that's the best way. It's like, I have a structure, but I, I'm free to improvise within it. Yeah. Um, okay. So what drew you to the fantasy genre? That's interesting. I mean, somebody once told me that, you know, all fiction was fantasy prior to modern times. I mean, I'm not a religious person, but you know, it's through somebody like me reads the Bible. It kind of reads like fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's all this magical stuff happening. And if you read all these old stories, they are filled with monsters and magic. Like I, to me, it's just kind of primal mythic storytelling. Like these are like the the Ur stories that kind of make up our world. So I I, I love that aspect about them. Uh, they're very sort of primal tales. Um, I might write other things at some point. I, I have been interested at some point trying to write. I grew up actually reading more science fiction than fantasy at times. Oh. So I, I I would I'd love to try something in it. I'm not sure when it's going to happen. I think it's probably when I have a, an idea that I feel strongly enough about. It, all my ideas right now are still in the fantasy genre. So I think that's where I'll be with my next couple of books, but I'm, I'd love to try something else. I like variety. Yeah. What are some of the books and authors that have inspired you? And this can be across any genre. Hey. Uh, I mean, it, I, I mean, I, I, as a kid, I probably read a lot of the classic stuff. Um, I was a huge fan of Dune. I've, read that whole series through twice, um, like Asimov's Foundation. Um, I kind of like all those older books. I was a fan of them. I read I read all the newer stuff too. I read a lot of science fiction when I was a kid, stuff like William Gibson, uh, uh, which is so different, but I love that stuff. I love loved all the cyberpunk authors. Um, and, you know, I still read new stuff. You know, I loved N.K. Jemison's uh, or was it the Broken Earth series? She calls it. That was, those were great. Fifth season was a great book. Um, you know, I kind of read. I, I read a lot of classics, and I read anything that's new that's really exciting too. Um, I'm just somebody who's always kind of looking for the next kind of, uh, you know, amazing book. I just finished uh, Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky, and that was that was 
really amazing. I never thought I'd like a book about uh, sentient spiders, but oh. great novel. All right. Well, this has been really, really great talking to you today. I just have one last question, and that is, what do you have coming up? Sure. Um, so I, in addition to uh, Amber Throne, um, which is more for adults, I guess, um, I have a series called uh, Confessions of a Dork Lord, which is a middle grade sort of fantasy series. It's sort of, uh, I don't know how you describe this, sort of Harry Potter meets Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Um, sort of, a, sort of, it's a, it's a really fun sort of series for like eight year olds. And I, I love reading. I love writing it. It's super fun. And I, I actually created it um, just to allow myself to do something different while I was working on Amber Throne novels because they're, they took a long time to write. Um, and I needed to sort of break it up creatively for myself. And so writing a sort of middle grade comedy was, I couldn't think of anything more different. So it was, it was just really a joy to work on because I, I could, it's still fantasy, but I could put myself in a completely different mindset, a completely different voice um, and have that variety. So it felt fresh when I was working on those. So the first book came out in 2020 in January and the second book um, is in line edits right now. And that'll come out um, next year, actually. Awesome. Um, and then I have, have another middle grade project I'm selling now. So I'm going to have a couple of middle grade things coming out and then I'm working on a new idea for an epic fantasy. Uh, that'll probably take a little longer to get out there, but I'm, it'll, it'll be exciting when it does. That's awesome. Um, also, I, I suppose I lied because I have another question and um, a, a little bit more about these middle grade books and writing two novels at the same time, especially what was that like? And like, do you have any tips for people doing that? Well, they, they weren't really at the same time. They, it was sort of a, you have these sort of giant gaps sometime in publishing um, where you sell a novel and um, while they're working on contracts and you're waiting for notes, sometimes you can just have six months of like nothing to do and that doesn't really work. So I, I had sort of written them in the gaps between each other when I really had no obligation to the other publisher. Um, and, and so it wasn't really that much overlap. I would say the hardest part was moving between the two voices. I, I found mm -hmm. that it was like a two week gap where it was just, where the writing was just terrible because I, especially that, that epic fantasy voice, which is all about these kind of long, slightly more elegant sentences and the middle grade voice, which is about these kind of really quick, choppy, witty, uh, sentences that always start with a conjunction. Um, it's just about as different as can be. So I couldn't, there was no immediate switching back and forth between the two, uh, especially when I had to generate new material. There was about a two week gap. It was actually kind of, that, that part was a little frustrating because it was, it was I, I, found it, I found it difficult. You can't just flip back and forth between the two. How did you prepare to get into the headspace for that again? Like to, to go back and forth? Or did you have any things that you did to like try and bring forth that middle grade vo voice? I mean, sometimes I'll re read other authors. I mean, once once the book was underway, I had the privilege of just going back and reading my own material and just getting that. That was easy because each voice is kind of unique to each book. So, like, I was able to just once once I got halfway into the book, I was able to just go back and backtrack and like kind of read my own work and you'd slowly get into that rhythm again. So, and now that I'm writing the second book, it's pretty easy because there's two full books kind of written, um, and I can just kind of reread my own stuff it's also the voice is more established now so i can go into it more quickly with the first book i was always sort of changing the voice so mm -hmm. sort of uncertain of what it was um but now once the first book is published it's you know it's done you can't change it you know what the voice is so in, in that way the second one was quite easy cool yeah well anyone listening to this i recommend you go check out all of his work um yeah thank once again thank you so much this was really great thank you for Read Between the Lines, my name is Molly Southgate. And I'm Michael Johnston. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after, the, the end. Best. Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. This episode is hosted by Molly Southgate. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group. You can get in touch with the show at readbetweenthelines at gmail.com 
or you can send us a voicemail at 708-887-9473. That was 708-887-9473. You can also find us on Instagram at Read Between the Lines Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.